It's hard to get used to saying good evening. <laughs> I hope everybody's had a wonderful day. It's good to see everybody. It's good to see all the visitors, all our church people. We thank you for coming out. Um, let's open up in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father God, Lord, we come to you just thanking you so much for this wonderful day, Lord, that you've blessed us with. Lord, we thank you for, for the ones here in attendance, Lord. Lord, we pray in the next few minutes, Lord, that we can clear our hearts. Lord, that we can clear our minds. Lord, that we can focus on you and the message Brother Randy has got for us. <clears throat> Lord, we, we pray for, for the Harmony Ridge, Lord, getting ready to come sing. Lord, we pray that we can, we can lift up all the praise, honor, and glory, Lord, that you deserve. Lord, we just thank you ever so much for everything that you do to us. Lord, we pray that your spirit be felt. Lord, just guide us. Lord, speak to us as only you can. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Harmony Ridge, I guess it's you guys' turn, and I'll sit down. <laughs> This, this is the way we like to play, just like we're playing at home. It's, it's nice. <laughs> Just kick off with a good in here.
this song kind of tells about where we're sitting right here. I really like it. y'all like Allison Krauss because this lady right here can sing just as good as she can. Thank you. 
Thank you a whole lot. Thank you. We're going to catch our breath just for a second and uh, say thank you for having us. I think this is our first time here. Mm -hmm. It's our first time being here, and we're tickled to death. And uh, we hope that when everyone leaves here tonight, you'll be feeling the same way. So uh, the uh, one thing I'll, I'll mention this in a lot of places we play, and it's just to, to give recognition where recognition's due is the applause makes us feel really good and, and we know you're feeling good when you applaud but the applause is all for him and what he allows us to do and, and we're just here to sing and, and hopefully bring a message and we like hearing it and it makes us feel good but and keep applauding that don't mean stop but just we like to recognize that we're just trying to use what little talent we've been given and, and use it in the right way to try to serve and that's why we're here um, another thing i'll mention we choose these songs for the words uh, we're, we're primarily a bluegrass gospel group, but we pull from all types of music, praise music, you know, old-time hymnals, just whatever we can find. But uh, most of these songs have touched someone in the group, and that's why they brought them. And, and so all these songs mean something to us, and uh, we just hope that, you know, you can find something in the song that, that touches you as well. That's our goal. So. So with that being said, clap your hands, stamp your feet, <laughs> applaud all you want, and we'll just have a good time. Just and don't throw nothing. Yeah, please, <laughs> it, yeah, if you want to throw, if it's, it's bad, it's too quick. <laughs> if it's bad enough to throw something at us, wait till it's over and throw it at us going out the door. <laughs> so, but uh, anyway, just enjoy ourselves and uh, and keep praising. That's why we're here. Thank you. <clears throat> Got one choking up over here. We'll no, no. Tis right. the season <coughs> to be plenty. Good to see Barry and Jenny. <laughs> we worked on Genevieve's house. She fed us every day. She pulled a grill out there, and I didn't want to get rid of that. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to work there all summer. They're going to en enjoy these girls. I'm going to say. They're going to enjoy this. I can't wait to hear it myself. <laughs> you and me both. Too.
<laughs> Excuse okay. us, we've uh, got a little shuffling going on here. And uh, I'm gonna take a minute to introduce everyone up here in case you don't know who's here. Uh, over on guitar, he's kind of, he kind of heads up this group and gives the technical advice and all the tunes and the arranging. That's Mike Brown on guitar. On the banjo is Tim Limeberry. Uh, one half of the beautiful singing is uh, Kim Kern, and on the bass, Chandra Harmon, and I'm Patrick Lindsay, and we are Harmony Ridge, so thank you. And uh, we'll shuffle some songs around and do one that's really, really, did I get that right? Yeah, okay. I thought maybe I got somebody wrong. But uh, anyway, we got a, a new song we're gonna, we've done it a couple times, but it's fairly new to us, and that's always kind of scary when you do that. But anyway, we hope you like it, and, Hope we'll get through it, but it's a, it's kind of an old timey, uh, another quartet song like we did, in, in an older style of uh, I think yeah, just guitar. Our brother, our brother sang on a key top. Okay. <laughs> Guitars went south. Guitars went south. On that one. All right. Not to Dixie. But uh, anyway, like I said, we worked this up, and there's a couple versions out there, but it's, it's in the older style of just guitar and quartet singing, and, and we try to mix that in. And we're gonna. We hope you like that. Yes, Mike is featured because he is playing guitar. That's great. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but his feature, his, his finger style is his, uh, he can play a lot of styles of guitar if you're not familiar with Mike's guitar play. And he is an award-winning guitar <laughs> player, by the way. <laughs> but uh, finger style playing is his forte, and so he'll get to demonstrate that. So anyway, if he's ready now, we're going to try to do one called Waiting at the Gate. <laughs> No wonder it didn't sound right. Well, did. <laughs> me, me and Patrick got the memo today <laughs> for, <laughs> for the closed memo today. So <laughs> he, he come in. He come in. I was already here, and he come in, and he said, he looked at me, and he said, "My shirt." <laughs> so, I'm in tune now. Yeah. 
We're going to do one more. <clears throat> we'll switch up keys again, so we'll take just a second. And it's kind of a, uh, it's a quick one, but that's. Uh, it's not the Christian rap song. <laughs> anyway, it's. Uh, <laughs> anyway. It's a uh, yeah. I get my respect. I'm, I'm used to that. That's okay. It's not like it's St. Patrick's Day or anything. <laughs> so uh, anyway. It's a, it's more in the bluegrass style, and it gets up and goes. We hope you enjoy it. It's called All Prayed Up. Well, that was incredible. Amen. Just appreciate Harmony Ridge being with us and sharing with us in song. We uh, decided several weeks ago, one a day, to, Mike was the first one I called. To, uh, we've been trying to get him here, and it was a good good time. So I appreciate that, Mike, and the group. And I uh, appreciate Brother Randy uh, being willing to join us for the next three nights. And uh, Randy and I go way back, um, some 20 years now. And um, he's now the pastor of Hillcrest Baptist Church that is down in Horse Pasture, Henry County on uh, 58. You know, for several years he was with the SBC of Virginia. And um, now he's, God's called him uh, to lead a church and he's doing a, a great job at that and appreciate him and Sherry Lynn. And uh, we've just been praying for this revival and praying for Randy to have the right words. And so... Uh, uh, let's make him feel welcome as Brother Randy comes on up. Amen. Thank y'all. That was good. Harmony Ridge. I'm going to, Mike, I need to get your contact information. I'd like to get y'all to come over and be with us one day. And uh, blessing. 
Y'all are a blessing to me, and I hope that the Lord will bless you tonight. I know He already has, and so thank God. Um, there's a group of people at Hillcrest praying for you, praying for us tonight, just so you know. And uh, I thank God that He has called um, us together. I, I think about the songs y'all were singing, and most every one of your songs is looking forward to going to heaven, looking forward to getting out of this old sin-cursed earth. And uh, going to that place where there is no sin, no sorrow, no death. And I look forward to that day, and I know many of you do as well. And uh, I like that last song y'all sung, All Prayed Up. You better be all prayed up. You know, if you're saved, you don't need to be all prayed up to go to heaven. We're saved, right? But what you better be prayed up for is to go out there tomorrow. And so tonight, open your Bibles to uh, Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to... Uh, read from, uh, start reading at about verse 10, and you've heard this passage many, many times, and, um, but I don't think we can ever hear it more than we need to hear it. I want to preach tonight on spiritual warfare and putting on the armor of God. I think about, uh, when we think about the armor, of, well, let's, let's read the text before I start talking. I'll get ahead of myself, I don't. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore... Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak, but that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Father, we pray your blessing upon your word tonight. I pray, O oh God, that we'll hear from you and not from this man. I pray, God, that we'll hear a message from you and that the Holy Spirit will empower it. And God, that we'll leave here today determined to be men and women of God, faithful and committed with the armor of God, for the purpose of doing battle for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, I pray. Now, when we think about this text and we think about um, uh, the spiritual warfare and we think about putting on the armor that Paul was talking about, I can see our, uh, 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 Paul and I can visualize him thinking back to the Old Testament and thinking back to the nation of Israel as they had to fight and they went into one battle after another over and over and over again, not just trying to make it to the promised land, but after they had made it to the promised land, they still had to fight battle after battle after battle. In fact, as soon as they crossed the Jordan River, what was the very first city that they came upon? You remember Jericho, right? How they marched seven times around that city until the walls fell. When they went into the promised land, the battles continued. Israel was entering the promised land, and yet battles had to be fought. 
And it's in the same, the same way for you and for me today. Today I stand before you as a saved child of God. I'm going to heaven when I die. And if Christ comes back before I die, I'm going to go to heaven in the clouds with him. Hallelujah, I prefer that. And so, but one way or another, I'm going to heaven when I die, but that doesn't mean I don't have some battles that I must fight. There's battles along the way. I'm an old man now, and I fought many battles over the years. Some of you, are, some of you men are getting there, and uh, you're kind of that way too, and you've had the battles, and you've seen battles, and you know that this life is filled with battles. It just is. The person I battle with the most is Randy, to be honest with you. I have more trouble with me than I have with anybody else. And if I can get this old flesh under control, then my friends, I'll have it completely, totally won, the battle won. And of course, when that happens, it'll be when Jesus has taken me home. Amen. And so uh, Israel had many battles that had to be fought, even though the promised land was theirs. And by the way, when you turn on your TV, you can't watch the news or you turn on your computer, you can't watch the news without seeing some battles that are being fought right now in the land of Israel, the land between the ocean and the river that God gave to Israel. All of that land in that region that's being fought over belongs to the nation of Israel. God gave it to them. But yet there's still battles, aren't there? They're physical battles, military battles, political battles, all kind of battles that are being fought. But Paul says here that you and I are not fighting a physical enemy. We're not fighting a material enemy. We're not fighting a physical battle. We're fighting spiritual, a spiritual battle with spiritual enemies. And we'd better be prepared and we better have the armor to fight this spiritual battle. 1 Peter 5 and 8, Peter says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And by the way, he was speaking to the believers and, and, uh, when he said that. He was speaking to those early Christians when he said that. He wasn't just talking about lost people that the devil's taken to hell. He said the devil wants to devour you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to kill you. And he wants to shut you up and keep you from being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the devil is trying to do. We are in a spiritual battle, and too many times we're totally unprepared to fight the battle. I, I get so sick and tired of the church thinking that we're in a political battle. Well, man, if we can just get this one in the office, and we can get that one in office, and we can vote this one out and vote this one in, man, our problems will be solved. How foolish and stupid that is. There's nobody on this earth that's going to set us free. Only Jesus can do that through the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Now, I'm not saying you ought not to vote. Of course you ought to vote. I'm saying you ought to... You, and by the way, all we've got to vote for is a lesser of two evils anymore, right? That, that's, where we, that's where we wind up. And you ought to do your civic duty, but if you put all your eggs in that basket, you're going to be sorely disappointed, and the devil is going to wear you out. I've seen it happen too many times. I've seen people fight battles they had no business fighting. That's exactly why Paul said, Timothy, Timothy, don't you entangle, don't get entangled with the affairs of this life. Keep yourself free from all of this political shenanigan. Keep yourself free from all this, these social issues that will swallow you up and be busy about the Lord's work and, the, and, and fight the spiritual battles that God puts before you. And let's start winning people to Jesus Christ and go out into the world and tell people that Jesus Christ is the answer. We need to fight the battle, but it is a spiritual battle, and we need to understand how to fight the spiritual battle. We know how to fight a physical battle. I mean, put your dukes up and let's go at it, and whoever comes out on top is a winner, right? I mean, that's, that's, kind of, that's the way, I mean, we see that. That's, that's obvious. 
But it ain't that way in the spiritual realm, is it? It's not that way when we're fighting the Christian battle, is it? We, we know how to fight a physical battle. We know how to fight political battles. We even know how to fight social battles. But we don't know how to fight spiritual battles. And that's why this text was written. This scripture was written to teach us how to fight the spiritual battle that is before us. Now let's begin. Let's just go through the text and look at it. First of all, in verse 10, he says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. By the way, I don't have a watch. I don't have a phone. I don't have nothing. So I I ain't going to know how long I've been preaching. When half of you walk out, I'll figure it's time to quit. So, no, I'm not usually very long. But anyway, um, we'll see. Any, anyway, he said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Not your might, not our might, not, not our, 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 the church's might, but in the power of his might. You know, what I, you know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid that we think the church is in a battle, and, but I'm not. We, we think the church, the, the, the collective church is in a battle, but I'm not a part of it. I'm just a bystander, an onlooker, watching to see what takes place. And, and too many times, I think we watch the battle go by and we watch the devil win the battle because you and I are not personally and individually engaged in the battle. You know, we, we, have, we have relegated to the institution of the church, what God intended for you and me to do as individuals. You realize that? We're scared to death that that the government's going to shut down our right to to speech, free speech. We're afraid that the government's going to shut down our right to assemble. And man, we want the church to stand up and fight those battles. Let me me ask you something. What would you say? Somebody said to me, just recently, they said, you know what? If, if people have to hide and, and be afraid and, and tremble and, and go into uh, 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 back rooms to, to worship and talk about Jesus, they're just cowards. I said, oh, wait a minute now. I said, back up. You think about what you just said. Think about what you just said. Uh, uh, do you, would you call the underground church in China cowards? Would you walk into an assembly in a basement in China and look at those people and say, you're just a coward? Would you go to Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia even, and uh, Egypt and Syria? Would you go into those countries? Would you walk into the underground church that's hiding in basements and attics? Would you go in there and say, you're just a bunch of cowards? No, you wouldn't say that. You'd be foolish to do that. But you know, you know what we have done? Here's why we think that way. Because we have relegated to the institution what God intended for the individual. You know why they hide in China to, 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 to assemble and study the word? Because they hide so that they can teach the word of God to believers who can go out into the the, the community and live out the word of God in their individual lives. And they're losing their lives. They're losing their businesses. They're losing their homes. They're losing everything because as individual Christians, they're standing up, they're standing for the truth, and they're paying the price for it. And we're so cowardice here in America that we want the institution to fight the battles for us. We're not willing to do it. And nobody is even trying to take our rights away. We're giving them up. Man, it's quiet in here. But but here, I just want us to see the truth of this thing. We, we are here. God called ministers and God called teachers and prophets and pastors to teach the church. We're supposed to teach the word of God. And then we go out into the community and we live out the truths of this book in our workplace, in our schools, in our homes, and where our entertainment, wherever we go for that. We go out into the world and as individuals, we live out the Christian life. Whether it costs us or not, no matter what it costs, we're willing to do it. Is that where we are? I'm going to tell you something. I promise you this. I say this 
with, with all the sincerity of my heart, I believe it with all my heart, persecution is coming to America. I don't see this country getting any better. I don't care who's president. I don't see this country getting any better. What I see in the Word of God is that men will wax what? Worse and worse. This world is going to hell. This nation is going to hell. And it ain't going to get better. And what you and I have got to do is preach the gospel so that individuals will be set free by the blood of Jesus and the power of His Word. And, 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 what, and as we go out and we do that, we will see the work of God. Now, if we're going to do that, we've got to be empowered to do that. And we have to be spiritually prepared. And if we're not spiritually prepared, if you go out and you do battle with the devil and you're not prepared spiritually, I promise you he's going to wear your tail out. You ain't got a chance. You ain't as strong as the devil. You ain't as smart as the devil. He will wear you out. Watch this. There was a group of men, Acts chapter 19. You can go read it later on. There were some itinerant Jewish exorcists who took it upon themselves to, to call on the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. Listen to what they said. We exorcise you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. In other words, by the Jesus that Paul preaches, we want you to go out. Also, also, there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And watch this. And the evil spirit answered and said, <coughs> Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? You ain't nobody. Jesus had the power. Paul was plugged into the power of Jesus Christ, but these men were trying to do a spiritual battle in their own strength. Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. They got the life beat out of them because they were trying to fight a spiritual battle without the spirit of the living God, without the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, if we're going to fight this spiritual battle and we're going to win this spiritual battle, we better put on the full armor of God. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, this verse tells us three things. Number one, it tells us who the enemy is. The enemy is the devil. Number two, it tells what we battle against, the wiles or, or the schemes the devil, of the devil. The devil is always scheming. He's always working. He's always preparing a trap. He's always trying to trip you up. He's trying to get you to do something or say something or go somewhere you have no business doing. And the third thing it tells us is what the purpose of this battle is. It is for you and for me to stand against the devil. That's what the purpose of the battle is. So how do we do that? Well, we put on the armor of God. So... Look in verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. We have a spiritual enemy. We're in a spiritual battle. And so we have to have spiritual weapons. The Roman soldiers wore a belt and it was more than, it was more than just holding up their britches. The belt that they wore connected their garments together, and it also carried their weaponry. Their sword would be on their belt. You've seen enough movies to know that a sword was always carried on the belt. The dagger was carried on the belt. There would be a hook there for him to hang his shield when he wasn't hanging the shield. So the belt was a very important part of the armor of a Roman soldier or of a Jewish soldier, whatever soldier it may have been. Psalm Chapter 18, verse 30, the Bible says, As for God, His way is perfect, and the Lord is true. He is proven. There is a spiritual battle that you and I must fight. And, and, the, and that, that belt was to carry uh, the, the weaponry that 
they used in battle. And you and I are to have the belt of truth. What is truth? You know what truth is, don't you? This book is truth. The Word of God is truth. The Word of God is truth. And so we have upon our waist, we wear upon our waist the truth, the Word of the living God. The Word of God is truth. And all other spiritual weapons hang on that. Every You don't even know what the spiritual weaponry is if, except for the Word of God tells us, right? You don't know how to use it except that the Word of God tells us. We don't even know what battle we're in except for the Word of God tells us. You can't even be saved and prepared to fight the battle except through the Word of God. And so the Word of God is our foundation. It is foundational to our faith and to our battle. Jesus says in John 8, 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There's power in truth. There's power in the word, and it is foundational to the battles that we fight. Verse 14, the latter part, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the breastplate was to protect the vitals. It wasn't just, just a little round thing across their chest. The breastplate would go around their shoulders, and it would cover their entire uh, torso, and it would cover their vitals, the very vital part of their body. And so it is a breastplate of righteousness that you and I are to wear. And, it, and that righteousness is our protection. It protects our heart. It protects our vitals. It helps us to be able to stand and fight the battles. And, and it is not my righteousness, by the way. It's his righteousness. If I'm standing, what is my righteousness? Think about it for just a few moments. What is it? What's the Bible say my righteousness is? Filthy rags. Now, you think about that for just a moment. You're going to put on a breastplate of filthy rags. How much protection will there be there? There's going to be no protection. You're going to be defeated. But when we put on His righteousness, His righteousness is impenetrable. I stand not in my own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And you know what? If you try to stand in your own righteousness, you know what the devil's going to do? He's going to remind you of every wicked thought. He's going to remind you of your past. He's going to remind you of your sins. He's going to remind you of your weaknesses. He's going to remind you of your failures. And he's going to tear your righteousness apart. And he will defeat you if you stand in your own righteousness. And I don't know about you. But my past wasn't all that pretty. I've got some stuff back there that I thank God Jesus forgave me for. And I'm telling you, every once in a while, the devil just tries to bring it to my mind. And you know what I do? I have to tell him it's under the blood of Jesus. And I'm not standing in my own righteousness today. I'm standing in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's that righteousness that protects my soul. It's that righteousness that protects my vitals when I stand before the Lord. Satan will tell you, you're not righteous. You're anything but righteous. But I can say to him, I stand in the righteousness of Almighty God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. The Bible says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We are his righteousness in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are right now, tonight, today. If you're a child of God, you are the righteousness of God if you're a follower of him. That righteousness is imputed. It is placed upon me and within me, and I stand in his righteousness. So when you engage in spiritual warfare, the devil will do all that he can to convince you that you're not, you have to remind him that it is God's righteousness through Jesus that you stand. Verse 15, having your shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel is the, the, pre, the preparation of the gospel. That is the, 
the very foundation upon which we stand. Truth and the word of God and the gospel that the Lord Jesus Christ, the truth. You know what the gospel is? It's the good news that Jesus paid for my sin and has saved my soul. Josephus, a first century historian, wrote this. He said that the Roman soldiers learned how to, to stud their shoes with sharp nails. You've seen tree climbers, haven't you? You see how they go up. They have these straps. They strap on their boots, and, and they're able to climb those trees. And, and there are five firefighters that have stakes on, on the front of their boots so that they can stand as they go up these mountains and fight fires. You see football players and baseball players. They all wear cleats on their feet. The Roman soldiers figured out how to drive nails in their shoes and to stand. And when they were in battle, they had a firm foundation and they would not be pushed back and they would not fall. The Bible says that we're to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It will help us to stand firm, stand upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. All else will fail. Nothing's going to help this world. Nothing's going to help our society. Nothing is going to help your lost family and lost friends except the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was in a hospital room this week with a gentleman dying from cancer. Uh, not cancer. He's dying, dying from cirrhosis of the liver. He lived his whole life drinking and, and doing everything he could to destroy his body. Now his body is destroyed and he's laying in a hospital bed. And I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I don't know what you would say to him, but I don't beat around the bush. And, and I don't mince any words. And I said to him, I said, brother, you know as well as I do that you're only reaping what you've sown. I said, sin has consequences and where you are today and, how, and what you're going through are the consequences of sin. And you know what he said to me? You're right, preacher. You're exactly right. And I said, Alan, I said, have you, ever, have you ever asked Jesus to forgive you and take over and control your life and surrender? I've done that dozens of times, he said. I said, yeah, but did you mean it? He said, well, I must not have. I'm right back in the same place again. And I just said to him, and I've been visiting him almost every day, and I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep telling him. I said, Alan, Jesus died on the cross for your sin. He was raised again to justify you. And one day he's coming back. And I said, I know this much. If you will sincerely, honestly, from the depth of your soul, call upon Jesus and ask him to forgive you and give you a new life and give what little bit of life you have over to him. I know he'll do it because he said he would. He said, I will answer those who call upon me. And I'm going to go back tomorrow. I'm going to stand in his room. And I'm going to say, Alan, have you surrendered your life to Jesus? And I'm telling you, I know. I know that I'll be able to know when he does because peace will flood his soul. And peace will come out of his mouth instead of the vulgar stuff that I hear now. You see, it's the gospel that makes a difference. Folks, we have to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. I'm, I'm afraid that we don't even care. I, Adrian Rogers asked a question one time in a pastor's conference. He said, I'm afraid that most of the pastors in this room have not told anybody about Jesus Christ and his love for them, the blood that he shed and the forgiveness that he offers in the past week. And it, but he said, the thing that concerns me the most is, he's, I don't think most of you even care. And what a shame and a disgrace that was to a bunch of preachers, thousands sitting in a conference. But I'm afraid that it's only indicative of what we find in the pews of our churches all across America. I'm not sure we even care anymore. I'm really not sure. And I hope tonight 
and, and we're going to see in just a moment, I hope we wake up and realize that we're in a battle, and this battle is for the souls of men and women and boys and girls. We need to stand on the firm foundation of the gospel and don't give it up for nobody and for nothing. The gospel is the only hope for a sin-cursed world or a sin-cursed soul. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now in their day, the shield was made out of wood. And they would take these shields and they would go into battle. Well, the enemy figured out pretty soon that if I could just shoot an arrow with fire on it, they would take arrows and they would wrap uh, tar and, 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 and some type of cloth around it and they would set it on fire and they would shoot it into those shields and they could eliminate the shield in the, in the battle. And so they learned to take those shields and they would cover them with heavy leather and that leather would protect the shield and keep that shield from burning. They later, later learned, learned how to use metal to cover the shield. But the shield was what they would use to quench the fiery darts, the arrows that were shot at them. And the Bible says here that it is our faith that will quench the fiery darts that the devil fires at your soul. You see, it's my faith in Jesus that stops those fiery darts of accusation that the devil throws at me. When he tries to remind me of my past, it's my faith in Jesus. Yeah, devil, you're right. I was a wicked, filthy, dirty, rotten sinner, but today I stand before God as a saint. Not because of how I act, but because of the sainthood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that He has made me a saint. By the way, did you know you never see in the Word of God, in the New Testament Scripture, you'll never see a Christian or a believer in Jesus called a sinner. We walk around and say, oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Like, like that's supposed to be humility or something. You are not a sinner saved by grace. You were a sinner, but you were saved by grace. Now you're a saint if you're saved at all. Ah, man, I can't tell if you all agree with me or not. But it's true whether you do or not, so it's all right. I I'm telling you, we should act like saints because we're saints. I cannot work my soul to save, for that my Lord has done. But I can work like a slave for the love of God's dear Son. For what He has already done in my life, I serve Him. I don't serve Him because I'm afraid of going to hell. That's been taken care of. I'm secure in Jesus Christ. I serve Him because I love Him and I want to please Him and I want to bring glory and honor to His name. And when I stand before him, I want him to be able to look at me and say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Don't you want to hear those words? Then let's put on the armor of God and let's go to battle and let's fight this spiritual battle that he has given us to fight. Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed, watch this, from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Your faith is, is your shield. You will live by faith if you live at all. Isaiah 7 and 9, look what he says. If you will not believe, surely you will not be established. Here, here's how the NIV puts it. It says, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. And that's it. When your co-workers start cursing and swearing and telling filthy jokes and, and, and acting ungodly, you, you're not going to stand up. You're not going to stand up and let them know you're a child of God who loves Jesus. 
and that you want them to be, you're not going to do it unless you have faith in Jesus. The only way you're going to do that is if you let your faith rule in your life and in your heart and in your mind. You remember the verse I read just a few moments ago, the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know what the very next verse says? The very next verse, 1 Peter 5, that was verse 8. Verse 9 says, resist him steadfast in the faith. In the faith, the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. You resist through faith and not one of us, there's not one of us that has not struggled with unbelief at some point in our lives. We all struggle with unbelief to some level. You remember, you remember the man who came to Jesus with his sick son? And he says, Jesus, he said, if you'll just, you just speak the word, <coughs> he'll be healed. And Jesus says, you know that all things are possible to anybody who believes. The man said, I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe in you, but please help my unbelief. You see, we need to strengthen our faith. We need to strengthen our faith so that we can actually stand and fight in the battle that God has given us. You know what the devil wants to do with you? Isolate you. You know what I see people do? They're struggling with their faith and they give up on church. I just had a whole family to leave Hillcrest. Whole family. I'm, I'm talking about mom, dad, son, daughters, in-laws, grandkids, the whole bunch. Got upset. Because they were having to go through something they didn't think they deserved to go through. And so what did they do? They abandoned the church and abandoned God. Well, they say they haven't abandoned God, but they did abandon the church. And they haven't gone to any other church, so I'm assuming they probably abandoned God. But you know what the devil wants? They want it. He wants to keep them out there. He wants to separate them from the body of Christ so he can isolate them and, and attack them. The devil is a roaring lion. You know, how a de you know how the lion destroys or kills its prey? Cut it off from the herd. Cut it off from the herd, isolate it, and then he can attack the individual animal and he can destroy it. You know what the devil wants to do with you? He wants to isolate you. Some of you are sitting here and you've got issues going on in your life nobody else knows about and you don't want them to know about it and you won't tell them about it. And, and the, 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 God has given you the, a whole body of people here who want to walk with you and help you and support you and help you get through what you're going through. Don't let the devil isolate you. Because if he does, he'll destroy you. You're a part of the body of Christ for a reason. You know that? He placed you in the body of Christ. The church is called the body of Christ. You know why? You see, if I'm, if, if I hurt, I burnt my hand the other day. I won't tell you how. It was stupid. I was foolish. But you know, the first thing I did, I reached over and grabbed. And my right hand reached over and grabbed my left hand and, and, and tried to help my left hand out. You know why? Because that's a natural thing to do. You see, when we're a body, the body of Christ, it's natural for us to help one another. It's natural for the right hand to reach over and help the left hand or the, right, or the left hand to help the foot or whatever is going on. But if the devil can isolate you, you don't have that help. Don't let the devil isolate you and destroy you. Make sure that you're a part of the body of Christ, that you're walking by faith with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Then verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Helmets have always been worn in battle, and they're to protect the head. They're, they're to protect the, the most vital part of the body, the head. First Thessalonians 5 and 8, the Bible says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. You know what he's saying here in this text? He's saying that salvation is our hope. I said it when I first began. No matter what happens in my life from here until the end, I'm going to heaven when I die. I'm going to be in heaven. That's my great hope. My hope is not in this world. My hope is not in my finances. My hope is not in my house. My hope is not in anything except Jesus Christ and the salvation that he purchased for me on Calvary. Satan wants to destroy your hope. When you lose hope, 
When you lose hope, you're an easy target for the devil, and he will take you out. But if you put on the hope of salvation, my friend, there's much more than just heaven when this life is over, isn't there? There's peace as we walk through this life. There's help. There's, there's contentment. There's spiritual prosperity. There's so much more that God does in our lives. Watch this, Romans 8 and 30. Moreover, whom he predestinated, these he also called. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I don't know how much better it can get than that. My wife and I were talking on the way home today. If there were no heaven and no hell, I would still be a Christian for the joy that he brings to my life as I walk through this life. It's worth serving him. It's worth living for Jesus if there's no eternity, which there is. But there's much more than just going to heaven. All right, so why do we put on this armor what do we do after we put on the armor? We, we take our stand. Verse 13, Therefore, take, on, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And the point is after the battle is over that we be found standing. Now notice in verse 18, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful, be alert. To this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And so we are to be alert and we're to keep praying. We're to be alert and praying and it's not optional. We're to be watchful. Romans 13, 11, And do this knowing the time that is, it is now high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the work of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Would you agree with me that the day is far spent and the night is at hand? Would you agree with me that things are getting darker and darker? When we look in the world today, we look at society, we look around us, darkness is closing in, and he says for us to wake up out of our sleep. Some people are just spiritually sleepwalking through life. Most Christians, I think, probably fall into that category. Just sleepwalking through life. I've got my, uh, my, my, my security. I've got my home. I've got my job. Most, maybe you've got your retirement secured. I was just with a friend today who just bought a $100,000 um, thing you live in and drive. Uh, thank you, RV. Yeah, it left me for a minute there. Now, I don't resent him buying that thing. But I thought, my Lord, don't put too much faith in that thing. It'll break down too. <laughs> I've seen them on the side of the road, had not you? Saw one just a couple of weeks ago. It had been it burnt to the ground. I bet it was a quarter of a million dollar RV. But but here's the thing. Let me just tell you, my friend. Our faith is in Jesus Christ. And we need to wake up and realize that our hope and our help is not found in this world. Don't be sleepwalking through life, church. Don't just mark time. We have too many people in our churches that used to be and used to do. We have too many people in our churches that at one time were but aren't anymore. It's time to wake up and to pray. And it's not optional. So what have we looked at? Number one, this life is a battlefield. Can you feel it? We're in a battle for the souls of men. We have a dangerous enemy at work, and he's the devil, and he hates you. He despises you, and he wants to destroy you and all that you have. It's obvious that worldly temptations are all around us, are they not? And it's obvious to me that my flesh is weak. I can't stand in my own strength. But Jesus won the victory. And I am more than a conqueror 
through him who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's put on the armor of God and go to battle. Let's go to battle. We leave here tonight. We go back into our homes and back to our workplace and back to wherever we're going. Go to battle. I'm not talking about a physical battle, a spiritual battle. Find strength in Jesus Christ. Walk in the faith of Jesus Christ. Be shod with the preparation of the gospel and take the gospel into a lost and dying world. Amen. Amen. Father God, I pray, Lord Jesus, tonight that you will challenge our heart. We've been challenged with the word of God, Father, through song and through preaching. But, Father, Holy Spirit, challenge and change us tonight is our prayer in Jesus' name. appreciate Brother Randy bringing the message. We're going to ask Harmony Ridge to come back up, and they're going to close us out. It wouldn't be right to uh, leave here without an invitation. If God's speaking to you, we're going to ask you to come. Maybe you just want to pray at this altar. No, go ahead. Come on up here. Maybe you want to pray at this altar. Uh, if you want me or Randy to pray with you, you grab us, somebody else. But let's just be true to the Holy Spirit tonight as they come and they sing.
believe the invitation has been sufficient. Hopefully you can walk out of here and say it's been good to be in the Lord's house. Amen. Amen. Just appreciate again Harmony Ridge and, and Randy and uh, just excited uh, for the next two nights. I just ask that you would uh, invite people, be in prayer. You know, this past Wednesday in our uh, we had a prayer meeting for this and I talked to the church a little bit about uh, revival and I said, you know, it starts in a small group. Uh, revival always starts in the hearts of a few and then spreads out. It, it renews those in the church and it turns into an evangelism movement. And, and so I pray that um, we'll understand. If, if not, that you'll understand tonight that we're in a spiritual battle. Uh, we've got the tools uh, through God's power, not ours. And so just Amen. appreciate Randy. We just pray for the other two nights and just invite you out. Uh, let us close in prayer. And then we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you, Lord, for uh, the songs that have been sung. God, we thank you for the preaching of your word, God, and the faithfulness of the messengers that you have sent. Uh, God, I pray that as we go out now, we go into the battle, Lord, that we'll go in your power, in your might, God, that we'll share the gospel, that we'll be a witness, yes, uh, God, that we'll do exactly what you've called us to do. God, this is um, a troubled world we live in, God, but your word says exactly that's the way it's going to be prior to the coming of Christ. And Lord, we must be ready for that. We must help others be ready. God, so let us help walk boldly in you and grow our faith each and every day. God, we pray that you would uh, uh, watch over this group. Uh, God, as they leave here tonight, bring us back the next appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.